that's a Canadian lynx. I, I think it's a monkey. That's a horse. And oh, 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 oh. Uh, it might be a coyote. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bam Bam, and welcome to the general public podcast, Randomness with me, Bam Bam. <laughs> I love saying it like that. You know why? Because I sound like Johnny Knoxville. Um, on my podcast today, actually, before I tell you who's on my podcast today, I would like to read you some intro lyrics in the words of the late and great Kurt Cobain. Come on, people now, smile on your brother, everybody get together, try and love one another right now. And that's a song from Nevermind, the album Nevermind, and it is called Territor- Territorial Pissings. <laughs> ah, the reason why that's relevant is because uh, we kind of are having a little territorial pissings these days and we've had it for decades and centuries because it is the war on the coyote now my guest today her name is jerry vistine hope i said that right she is a real deal scientist and a world-renowned expert on carnivore ecology basically she studies the ecosystems with carnivores she's going to tell you all about that if you listen at first before i talked to her i had this ordeal of like kill the coyote or not to kill the coyote That is the question. After talking to her, I'm starting to wonder about the idea of if we really should be killing them. I'm not going to lie. I'm sorry, Jerry, but there are certain instances where I do feel like, yes, they should be killed. Most people can agree on that. But after talking to you, you've opened up my eyes and it makes me want to go do a little more research and understand your point of view of why we shouldn't kill them. And anyone that's listening that doesn't have an understanding of coyotes should listen to this podcast because coyotes are branching out all over the place they're showing up in cities towns suburbs they are all over the place and we need to have a better understanding so we better know how to live with them if you also want to check out you can check out a book called coyote america by dan flores great book me and jerry we concur on that one also if you just don't want to read the book and you can want kind of want to hear dan flores talk you can go to joe rogan episode 942 with joe rogan and dan flores that's the episode that got me really hot, like pumped up about coyotes and piqued my interest. Also, Gary has other information that you might be interested in uh, after you listen to the episode or even if you don't listen to the episode, you can go check her out. She's got a website, which I'm going to put the links uh, in my description and in the description of my social media posts on my Instagram for this episode. Uh, she has a website um, called Coyote Center where it's uh, an informational website of, oh, well, I forgot to mention, she's from Maine. So it's mainly about the importance of coyotes in Maine. So go check out her links, go check out her information. It's, it's really sweet stuff. It's uh, very interesting, I must say. Anyways, so ladies and uh, everyone else. Yeah, so here we go, the Coyote Podcast. By the way, episode 40! Ah! <laughs> but whatever I can find that piques my interest and entertains the fuck out of my mind. Hi. Hello, Bam Bam. Hi, I'm Jerry Vistein. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Well, this is a different setup for me. <clears throat> Usually I do it over my phone, but it works. Are you good? I'm okay. Good. <laughs> yeah, I'm great. How are you? I am well. It's a beautiful, sunny, crisp day here in Maine. Out in the Stephen King country. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever gone Stephen King hunting? Um, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough. Everybody knows him, though. Everybody knows him. But you have seen his house. Have you seen his house? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I've seen, seen his books. I've seen pictures. It's not that hard to see. It's like a, it's like a horror movie. It makes sense. Yes, he, he, he creates some really 
pretty heavy duty horror stories too. Let me tell you, I've seen one of them. I don't think I'd want to watch it again. But he's a very, very good writer. Yeah, yes, I've seen all well of his known. movies <clears throat> when I was a child. He does good stuff here. Yes. All right. So, what is it? Uh, what's your title? Who am I? Oh, who is this lady? So, um, I am Jerry Vistein, and I am a conservation biologist here in Maine. And so, I my my focus is carnivores, though. You know, when I I went back to school as an adult, and my father said to me, Jerry, why do you want to do carnivores? Why don't you do birds? He said, That'd be a little easier, don't you think? Some and, birds are uh, carnivores. <laughs> and yes, they absolutely they are. Some birds and are cannibals. Said, no, this needs this is something that I see a need for. So um, my work focuses on carnivores mm-hmm. and our relationships. So there's a whole history on this con- American continent, both in Canada, North America, and Mexico, of how life was before the Europeans came here 500 mm-hmm. years ago and how it is now. And so a lot of people don't even know the history that happened with our this beautiful continent that we all live on and what happened to the carnivores and the worldviews the Europeans mm-hmm. brought over. So right now, you and I and everyone else that's living now on these continents, we're living in this pretty amazing transition time. Mm-hmm. We're going from the time, kill them all, Let's get rid of them. They have no value. <laughs> um, to the yeah. big bad wolf, too. Wow, we're learning all kinds of cool things about them, mm. and we need them here, and we want them here. And how can we do this? How can we farm with them? How can we live with them? Um, what kind of skills we do? So we're you and I are in that really fascinating time of using our creativity, our talents. And no matter what they are, an artist in writing and science to shift how we relate with our fellow wild kin on this continent. And that's the work I do. So when I went back to school, I went to school in the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana, because I wanted to be my focus um, to for carnivores. And my yes, and so I had quite an experience there because that's the one place in this country where um, most of the whole set of our carnivores still exist. And, and so my, my goal was to be, I call myself a bridge biologist. So, you know, in all these big universities, they're doing all this kinds of research. Okay. Mm-hmm. How, many, how much of that reaches our people? Not much at really? all. Not much at all. And so, and, and yet the reason they're doing it is we want to find out about them. Mm-hmm. We want to find out about them. So it, 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 what happens is it stays in the hallowed halls of, of the universities and never touches our people who live with them. So I wanted to be this bridge biologist. I wanted to take that science and I wanted to bring it to the people in really uh, engaging ways on many, many different levels so that we can recreate a different future with the knowledge that we have. So I do... I kind of operate a little differently than a lot of other scientists do. So I leave the research part to my fellow biologists, and then I take and gather all this, and I bring it to our people. So I'm a real people's biologist. So (laughs) I travel all over Maine from Fort Kent, which is on the Quebec border, um, all the way down southern Maine, which is down into New Hampshire and everywhere. And and right now in our Coyote Center, which we've created, um, you know, with social media, which you and I are on right now, Bam yeah. Bam, um, we kind of like a lot of what we do is sharing with others across the continent and in Canada. Um, and I also have a wonderful colleagues in Canada, Canada, um, Coyote Watch Canada, who does amazing work um, in Canada as well. And so it's really, really wonderful to be doing this. So I worked as a, an independent biologist, and I wanted to be free. I wanted to be like coyote free. Coyote free. So, yeah, so I could, that freedom is the most important thing for coyotes, their freedom to be who they are, wild canine. <laughs> and so I wanted to be free so that I could really do what I saw the need to do and not feel like I needed to work for an agency or an organization that was saying, you can't do that, you can't say that. Um, And so 
about th- two years ago, I created our nonprofit called the Coyote Center. Yeah, and I, wa- I, I don't, I don't think I've ever came across a center that's protecting coyotes. That's right. Well, here you are. Yeah. I, I've <laughs> so I've seen videos yeah, of coyotes so. that are pets, and I I was like, okay, I guess that's a thing that can happen if you get it young enough, but. So Coyote Center, I have it as a title to honor a native wild dog, Mm -hmm. but the full one is, because I couldn't make it shorter, it's long, so the full title is Coyote Center for Carnivore Ecology and Coexistence. So Mm. basically Coyote becomes the teacher of all our relationships, so with our carnivores that are out in the ocean, our sharks, okay, Uh, and our, 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 our amazing whales, and also as well as all the, the predator fish, but as so all our avian predators, our great hawks, our owls, eagles, and also our terrestrials. And so I kind of like really speak for all of them, but Coyote becomes kind of the teacher because Coyote's among us. Do you have some questions, Bam Bam, that you would want to share? Or do well, you... I, got a, I got a bunch of questions. Is, um... Okay, go for it. I, know, go I, for I wanted it. to hear all that because uh, I was very, I was curious to what your study was. Because I saw that you have the the coyote center, so I'm like, oh, okay. So she's like specifically for coyotes. I know, like you said, all carnivores and everything. Full study, which is very interesting. And um, I find it interesting because, like, every animal has a purpose. You, you just can't decimate them all. Like the most important one, after watching uh, the documentary Shark Water, you realize how important the shark is to this planet. Pretty much without sharks, we're nothing. Because <laughs> they, they full on keep the balance. Uh, I forget, they eat a certain fish that goes after the, the you, you might know how to explain this better, but there's a fish that goes after a plantation that brings over the oxygen from mm-hmm. the Amazon across the ocean to North America, and the shark keeps the balance of that fish. So without sharks to keep it balanced, they would eat up all our oxygen. Correct? Absolutely. There, yes, oh, absolutely. And plus, yeah. they do other things too. There's other other examples of how they keep balance like in the the rays you know the big rays they um the issue i'm controlling those rays as well because rays can disseminate a shellfish completely disseminate them as well oh. and you don't know the role of the shell we as humans really there is so much we don't know about the magic of our planet <laughs> you know, we're starting to discover like you said just the example of what you're talking about what they're doing in the pacific we're just discovering this Mm-hmm. And that's why we need to protect it so that we don't destroy something before we even have a clue of what's going on. Yeah. And and that's what happened in the past, you see. So what we're trying to do now is like, we want to learn. We want to learn. And when more you learn, it's like, wow, we're in a cool place. <laughs> oh, it is a very is cool rich, place. <laughs> you know, and I, life is rich if we, um, if very, very rich if we protect this complexity because it's mm-hmm. enriching yeah. our lives. It also well, saves our lives. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I people should know a little bit more about the ecosystem because I I, I, I I don't know if I should I'm gonna say it just because I'm honest, but I I'm for hunting, right? Because um, uh, like I get the debates with people, they're like, oh, you're you're pro hunting and all this. I'm like, well, yeah, because the ecosystem needs to be kept in check, right? And conservation. I'll read it to you after, but I have the whole breakdown of how 100 percent of all hunting materials, tags, tickets all go towards conservation. And Well, you know, hunting, you know, humans as a species, mm-hmm. as a species and our ancestors, we are hunter-gatherers. Yeah. It is in our genetics. We are hunter-gatherers. And, and so um, here in Maine, our Coyote Center, we support traditional hunting, okay, um, and um, support traditional hunters because those who know how to use an instrument to Mm -hmm. kill and kill them and then use their bodies that's what our traditional that's what traditional hunters and that's who the hunter gatherer of our species who we are and who we do so it's very much in our our genetics and actually to me it is much far more humane far more humane than taking animals and keeping them in domestic captivity and living miserable lives like our cows, mm-hmm. um, and then having somebody else kill them, and then we go to a meat counter where it's nice and clean, and we need to think about things like that as how how we get our food. You know what I mean? So when a person who hunts and they go hunt their deer, they have respect for that species that they are killing and use their body. Okay, 
Oh, There's fully. a big difference. So uh, I, I totally respect and support traditional hunting here in Maine. Maine is a very big hunting state and a traditional hunting state. And we strive to keep it to that place where it becomes truly traditional hunting and doesn't go off yeah. on the side yeah. where things that are be called hunting are not hunting at all. <laughs> I mean, well, no, some things are really, um, they're more become more genocides and more things that are done for fun and for cruelty. And the more that we as humans have the instruments to do it, if we don't have that sense of restraint, I haven't talked about give my talks that hunting, true hunting, is about respect for the this beautiful animal that you're going to take their life and also restraint. Mm-hmm. So that's a beautiful combination. That is that traditional hunting hunter. Do you know, uh, sorry? Pardon me? I was going to say, do you know Stephen Ranella? No, I do not. He has, um, he has a show on Netflix called Meat Eater. And I always like to recommend the show to people, especially people who probably don't appreciate hunting or don't respect it. I'm like, well, go watch how he does it. Uh, and one of the main things is if he can't get that clean shot, because the clean shot is the lung shot, right? The animal's probably dead in under 10 seconds, and it's a pretty quick death. But if he can't make that shot, he won't take it and because he's an ethical hunter. And um, <laughs> whenever I get into debates with people where they're all like against hunting, and their their main argument is, oh, we're encroaching on their land. It's like, do you live in a house or, or in a brick and mortar business or anything? And they'd be like, yeah, I'm like, then you've already encroached. It's too late. Um, it's But for a hunter, even Stephen Ronella says, death by bullet is probably the best death a, and let's say a deer can hope for. What's a deer's lifespan? A few years, right? Yeah, not very long. No, not and very long. It's either it gets uh, hunted down by a predator and eaten alive, or it gets old and um, you know breaks an ankle, can't feed itself, starves to death. It's just there's so many worse ways it can die. So you know, death so, by and also, hunter. Yeah. And so you know, Bam, the thing is too that um, uh, you know deer and any kind of herbivore Mm -hmm. ungulate um they require their predator so the way the the earth has been created the mother nature and has evolved for millions of years is the 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 herbivore requires their predator so that they thrive and they kept in balance and all that good stuff okay how should i say all that good stuff but creating a really healthy ecosystem for them and so they require a predator. So what happens is humans, we are one of their predators. And that's why so we get tickets, right? You can have our, our, our carnivores are their predators, but also humans are predators. Okay. And because our culture it keeps changing and we have immense technology and we live in we live in a culture that's trying to find its balance, as you well know. Mm-hmm. There's things about our humanity that need to be a bit refined, you know what I mean? (laughs) When it comes to our relationships with other life. And so, yes, it is that they, that humans play the role of one of the predators of these species. Humans play the role of one of the predators. Yeah, and the, the purpose for hunting tickets, right, is because people like you will do studies and you will determine that there is a certain species, like let's say a white tailed deer, there's too many of them in that ecosystem. That's why there's X amount of tickets handed out each season. Because a white-tailed deer can eat, well, I don't know, I forget what plantation, but it'll eat up too much of a plantation. It won't pollinate properly in the ecosystem, and it, it's a mess, right? It's huge. It's huge. That is why the earth kind of created that balance, because a deer, mm-hmm. deers do not control their own populations. They need the predator to control their own populations because they really can destroy an ecosystem if their numbers get too high. Yeah. So here in Maine, in the time, if you have high insurance, same thing in Canada. If the snows get way too high, what happens is they're just they're just grazing all the way up the tree. You can actually see, and they stand up and do it, and then they eat all all the um, small little um, saplings. So there's a, a a woman that I know where I live, a friend of mine, where she has a large acreage. Mm. And generous number of, of um, deer that come through, too many. There's a certain balance of deer in the ecosystem we find. Um, more than 15, 15 deer per square mile is too much. That's, the, that's like the balance. So what she's seeing is lots of deer on her property. 
um, everywhere in her town, wherever coyotes open their mouth, they're shot and killed. Okay, so there's no predator for them. Mm -hmm. And she, she takes me to this really great, beautiful beech tree. And she says, look at this, Jerry. Here's this beech tree. There are no saplings under it. Why are they not there? Deer have eaten them all up. And once that great tree dies, that's it. And so we're seeing that balance. But not only that, but also the understory. I always tell people, when you go, when winter's gone from Canada, Maine, and mm -hmm. you're in the forest, mm -hmm. look for an understory. Do you see any understory? Or is everything eaten up with the reason only um, the ferns? Because deer will not eat ferns. Okay, and the other piece we're seeing, too, when there are too many deer is that deer, our deer on this continent have evolved with their plants. So you have an invasive species. They won't eat it. <clears throat> really? So what happens is they're eating all the native plants that our native birds, butterflies and bees require. And then the non-native are taking over and our Birds, bees, and butterflies will not use those at all. So keeping that, it's a beautiful balance. And sometimes I said to people, when you go in the forest, really look at what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we don't know what we're not seeing because it's been gone long before any of us were born. You see? See, I got a question here. <clears throat> okay, okay, so scenario for anyone listening. Let's, let's, uh, let's get the record straight here so that people can full on understand. If there's no predators and we full on allow the deer to just eat away as they please <clears throat> what's the what's the scenario that's going to happen what's the damage well, that they're going to cause well we see a bit already here in maine and we see it all over the continent so first of all in maine for instance an example with way too many deer in most parts of maine different in different parts of maine but mm -hmm. in many areas mm -hmm. way too many deer and first of all that's not good for the deer overpopulation of any species including our own is not good for the species it takes away from the quality of their life and the hell. And so that is not good for them. But what we're finding in one example, just one example, is when you have lots and lots of deer, there is such things as ticks, okay? Huge issue here in New England, Maine, um, that mm. the ticks cover these deer bodies and they breed like you can't believe because they have a lot of deer bodies to do it on. Their nymphs, which are basically their babies, fall to the ground, seek a blood meal, find a mm -hmm. white-footed mouse that carries the Lyme disease bacterium and bites it, and then takes off and finds one of us that are in the meadows and walking with our dogs, and we get Lyme disease. And Lyme disease it's a very serious disease. There's a lot we really don't even know. We have the pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. Lyme disease is often spoken of the unspoken one. But many, many people suffer greatly from it for the rest of their lives. It, and this comes from the in That's just one example of the lack of balance that happens. And we're not talking about our bird populations just plummeting because they don't have habitat. And they... Another example also is that, you know, when our birds come back to the north and yep. they're feeding their babies? Here now. They, yeah, they need to feed their babies protein, not seeds, okay? And that protein mostly in the form of caterpillars. And caterpillars require habitat for them to live on, native habitat. And they what won't the live. Eat. I mean, right, what the deer eat. So if the deer, deer eats too much, there's no caterpillars, and then the birds can't feed their babies. Caterpillars can't have babies, and their babies fail. And so all their, all their chicks die. There's actually been some research by an amazing entomologist in um, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Dr. Ptolemy has written a couple of books about this. Um, and yeah, and so our, deer popul our, our bird populations fall as well. So you can see we call coyotes anywhere wolves are not present coyotes are a keystone carnivore they really affect the entire system by the hunting that they do <clears throat> so coyotes do eat deer we want them to especially we want them to how many okay? coyotes does it take to take down one deer <laughs> um basically first of all it depends upon the deer so coyotes mm. are um coyotes just like wolves they they understand, you know, deer are no wimps. I always use that term. They're no wimp. They're powerful beings in their own right. And so no coyote is going to 
take on a deer that is strong and healthy and powerful because they know that all that deer needs to do is kick them once in the jaw and they're dead because they can't hunt and they can't eat anymore. So they're very, very well of the danger and the power of their prey. And so, so but our- if it's a weak one, a weak, pile, a, a weak deer, and there are many who are suffering out there. We just, as humans, we just don't see the deer that are weak or unhealthy mm-hmm. or starving, mm-hmm. even though for us it looks otherwise predator knows they can read them and so what happens is if in cases like that where it's a deer that is in any way vulnerable two coyote mates can take a deer down absolutely they can absolutely they can and and we want we want them to now the other example the only thing is is that humans aren't looking for those deer okay ah the deep in the bush no one wants to go that deep that's right they're not they're not stick to the trail (laughs) <laughs> They're not looking for the deer that has a broken leg. They're not looking for that deer. They're looking for another kind. And also they're doing it for a very limited time of the year. Coyotes have this thing over across. And there's research showing that research, that coyotes are hunting year round. And so the effect that the coyotes can have on the deer population. And what happens is it makes the deer population healthier. We're finding in research that wherever the predator is present, the deer actually are becoming bigger. Really? They're becoming larger. Well, because they deer have lived with the predators in North American continent for tens of thousands of years. There's this predator prey thing. Would you say that they're getting bigger because they're they have to run more often, building more muscle? <laughs> no, more because they what's happening is they are taking out the weaker and also the same thing. And sometimes when I give my talks, I show a little fawn and I say, you see that fawn? That fawn is not Bambi. Mm -hmm. That is a wild fawn born to a wild mother. Okay. So they're all born that, you know, I don't know where they're, when they're born in up in Canada, but mostly in the United States, they're born in mid May to mid June at one period of time. Okay. Mm. The whole ecological thing that happens. And so any of their predators, bear, bobcat, coyote, has only that time. And they always say that fastest, the smartest, and that sharpest little fawn, no predator will get. Mm -hmm. She is going to grow up to be a mother and give off her great genetics. And if he's a male, the same thing. And so that's how they become stronger, larger, because... Predator is, is doing is affecting that. But again, this is these are things you know, Bam, that we as humans don't see. Yeah. We're finding these things out from our science. So people don't see this. And people can't even really read how healthy a um, a fawn is or a a large deer is. We can't. We don't but we can't see or experience what the predator does, what the wild predator. The other piece too, and I learned a great deal from native people is because our native peoples lived on this continent for 17,000 years with coyotes and other predators long before Europeans ever set foot here. And they always had the, they always had this respect for their fellow predators that they never said, we humans are the only ones that can take them and you can't. <laughs> it was, we all, because we're sharing the land. Well, we're going to have to figure out some respect for the coyotes here because a lot of people don't have it. I'm 50-50. I appreciate them, but from what I know, I'm just like, eh, you guys are murderers. But <laughs> see, there's things that interest me. You were telling me how uh, earlier we were talking about, oh, what was I saying? Uh, decimating animal populations, how it's not a good thing. And I was reading, it was actually from Dan Flores' book, where I was listening, and I was listening to his talk on Joe Rogan, and he was saying how there was a, a time in history where there was the war on coyotes, and that was from 1915 around to the 1950s. And in that time, they didn't think that coyotes and wolves were different, and they they literally almost made wolves extinct in the 1930s or 40s, I believe it was somewhere around there. But the coyotes didn't even put a dent in their population. Because it's easy to take out a wolf pack. You just got to get the alpha. Then put the body on a corpse, and then the rest of them will come. Bam, bam, the pack is gone. But a coyote, he was also saying that once you kill too many, 
then they realize that they're getting slim and kind of populate more out of like off of uh, your regular hype, um, mating season. So is that true? So basically, you know, the Bam Coyotes have been on the American plant continent for five mm -hmm. million years. So they are super highly. Oh, evolved. they're survivors. Yeah. They are absolutely highly evolved. And so they have figured out ways, first of all, to practice immense birth control. They have the ultimate birth control. The other thing is they're survivors. So what happens, and um, it's a compens com compensatory kind of reproduction is the term that you use that he was talking about. Wolves do it too, but wolves are far, far more vulnerable than human persecution than coyotes are. They both suffered tremendously from that, but um, coyotes have perfected that compulsory com um, reproduction by having, it's the idea is that it has to do with survival. Okay, we're looking around. Well, there's not, there's no other coyote families around here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a really big, big territory here now. Lots of food, lots of food. That means I can have more babies. And so how the female's body, we're talking magic of our continent and these species, her female's body clicks into that. Mm -hmm. I can have more babies. So is that, and, is that when they're howling? Then, like Then she compensates by having more babies and her babies are larger and she is healthier too because there's lots of food because there's no other coyotes around because they've all been killed. Mm -hmm. So the ones that remain have the capacity to have a great deal of food. It has, food is survival in the wild. It's food is survival. And so they have the capacity to do it and they've perfected it. They've per it is not a way that coyotes prefer to live. That's not really their norm. It's not how they live with our native peoples at all. This is something that they have, re it's something that they're using a great deal now because there is so much persecution. And I really like, I really like the term that you use. Can I go back to it for a yeah, sure. bit? <laughs> is the idea, because I love, I, I, I'm really big because I give talks and I have, sometimes I have men stand up in my talks and curse coyotes out in front of 70 people. And I actually, but the thing is, but I always have great respect for everyone who speaks their voice and wants to be a part of that conversation. Because if we don't talk about these things, how do we move forward in our relationships with our wild kin? You know, um, so, you know, the thing is when you made the comment that they're murderers and that's the thing is like, that I love. no, I love how you say that because you're saying something point blank out there. And oftentimes we need to do that because then we have conversations with each other. And it's just like you say, you have things where people say, oh, I'm totally against hunting. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear about it. And so what's happening is we're not communicating, we're not sharing. And when we share, that's when things are rich all the way around. Mm -hmm. So the idea, oftentimes with humans, when we see a predator kill another animal, we say that they are murderers. But what we're doing is we're taking our own human experience that when we as humans kill another human, we are murderers. And we are putting our own emotional, violent self on that wild being who is only killing to survive, only. And there's one amazing scientist who speaks, he's been all over the world um, with the big cats and everything. He says there's wild carnivores um, have no hate, have no violence. There is no cruelty in their attempt to hunt their wild prey and to kill them. There's none of that emotion. That, that's They're not doing it from that point of being a murderer. They are surviving. That's They want to survive. They want to eat. And it's very interesting. Yeah. As we as humans, yeah. though, we can do horrific. Are you familiar at all with factory farming and slaughterhouses? Mm -hmm. But the immense yeah. cruelty that humans put on food animals and we don't see ourselves as that. Why? Because it's wrapped up in these nice little plastic packages in our grocery store. But the violence that goes in the way we do food animals today, that should be unacceptable. But the thing is, people don't see it. It's all very, very hidden. And so we tend to take a lot of our own emotions of how we do things as humans that are violent 
and we put it on the but on while being, and that's not their intent. <laughs> you see what I mean? Well, it's also <laughs> it's also like YouTube. There's this Russian guy that I watch. Uh, I forget his name. Um, if you go onto YouTube and you Google "I am Puma," there's this guy, dude out in Russia, and he's got a he's got a Puma, and it's no different than a dog or a cat. It takes it takes a bath with him, it cuddles with him, it has toys, you know. It's always just sits by the window, like wants to play, you know, stuff like that. And there was this one video I watched where he put a cat, a fish, in the bathtub. The Puma had no idea what to do with it. I'm like, oh my god, look at this! Because it was raised out of the wild, it doesn't have his predatorial instincts. Right? He had no idea what to do with it. He he was just staring at it and kind of tapping on it. Meanwhile, if that was in the wild, that, that fish would have been out in two seconds and he would have bit its head off, you know, because he's hungry. Yeah, absolutely. But As an example. Yes. Yeah, people are getting yeah, filtered out by videos like that because they, they see that these animals can be domesticated. But it's, it's, not, it's not the same if you go to the wild. Go find that same species of puma. And then when he's up in a tree, go try and tickle his chin and see what happens to you. It's going to be a whole different story, man. Right. But yeah. And the other piece of it, though, is that we don't want to domesticate them. I've had people go, they, the coyotes are beautiful and this and that. Oh, could I have them for a pet? No. <laughs> wildness, wildness is a precious gift on our planet. I don't think Jesus. anyone should domesticate all like animals on the regular. But I'm saying sometimes when you see this, I, I think he has some kind of um, animal sanctuary out in Russia because he also has right. a, um, a cheetah and some other things. So he, he's prepped for it. He knows what he's doing, right? It's not for your and average also, person, but I do appreciate the, the odd person who does have them and takes care of them because who knows why maybe that animal needs that kind of care. Well, also, though, too, he could not release them for a reason why they're not releasable. In other words, they, they may not be well or be injured in some way mm -hmm. um, or never, ever had parental teaching at all. So to send one out into the wild, if he got it, when he received one of those when they're just three weeks old, they've had none of their mother's teaching, to put them back out there is certain mm -hmm. death. So I understand some of those things with the sanctuaries. But yeah. um, it, there's, you know, there was, a, um, I saw this talk here in Maine. We have lots and lots, way too many um Way too many, um, this is the same kind of thing, um, dams here in Maine. Maine has great rivers. I love the state because <laughs> we have these great, great, beautiful rivers that go to the sea. And they're talking, the huge, uh, the, the um, Atlantic salmon, Maine is one of those rare places, and they're talking about them. One person asked them, well, what's the difference between, you know, bringing these Atlantic salmon, really bringing these dams down, and then this, um, these farms where they have salmon farms. What's the difference? And the difference is you can't even compare the difference because, first of all, salmon farms are like zoos. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. salmon that live in these farms, just like you're saying with the puma, they have nothing, and they're also not contributing anything to the ecosystem of the river and of the oceans. And so uh, a wildness contributes a great deal to the earth and to us. But as humans, again, we're still, we're still really learning. We're learning a lot and we know very, very little yet. So it makes a huge, huge difference. Um, and, and, um, and we're and, uh, about how we understand how the whole system works. Yeah. Did you have another yeah. thought or question? Because I, 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 I want, I love, I love your, I love how you say things straightforward, Ben. Because that, that's how I am in my talks, and I, I'm always grateful when man comes and I always think any person who comes into my talk and, and really speaks up about something different than what I'm saying. So I'm sharing the science. I'm not sharing my personal perspective. I'm sharing the science, but they come with their perspective. I always feel that that person has a door open that wants to learn. And that everybody in that room is learning too, so that we're learning how to be with each other. Yeah. And we have different perspectives. And that's how we start growing. <laughs> how much time? And that was like, well said, touche. <laughs> how, much, how much more time do you have? Well, how much do you have? Well, I got yeah, some time. Yeah. Well, I thought you, you were going to say, like, oh, I, you have a few more questions or. It's okay. I'll oh go no, on. no. Well, I want to know what happened because we've we've just been on for about a, a little bit over a half hour. Yeah, I do about an hour, hour and a half. Depends how so good the conversation. You'll do an hour. How's that? For that? Okay. That's absolutely. Because <laughs> after that, you you won't have more people. They'll they'll get get tired of watching after an hour, right? Well, That's no. As I'm long sure. as the information's good, and then you listen. Yeah. What? <laughs> 
Now I wanted to go to because you coyotes really interest me, and you you seem to be really into it because you have your coyote center. Now, um, coyotes are what the the only animal in North America that's in every single state. Yes, they they are in every state in the union, um, and the reason being is they are actually filling niches where wolves once lived. So when the Europeans came here 400 years ago, just 400 years ago, wolves lived in every single state in the United States, and uh-huh. they lived all over Canada. So okay? how, come, how come wolves aren't like that anymore? Because the United States had an all an all out extermination of every last wolf yeah. in North America. That was the war on the coyote um, that I mentioned. That's right. And so it was an it was a federally support and we're the only country in the whole world, and it's not something to be proud of, the only country in the whole world that did a federal actually um, um, genocide of our carnivores. And mm-hmm. it's not only mm-hmm. wolves, but a great view, golden eagles. Have you ever seen a golden eagle? Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, many, 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 many uh, are, are cougars our um, grizzly bears, all of them. It was a time, the 1800s especially, was a time of absolute, it's, time, it's called in this country, the United States, the time of extermination. So, um, and so, and so as a result, you know, all the wolves were gone, except for a small group up there in Northern Minnesota, um, close to Canada, right in that area there, by the Voyagers National Park up there. It is so mosquito-y up there that evidently mm-hmm. individual humans didn't want to go there um, to kill the wolves. So the wolves hung out there, hung out, and the mosquitoes actually protected them just like the mosquitoes. Because people them. couldn't get in there, okay? They just couldn't bear because mosquitoes were so heavy. <laughs> it was the same thing with our, our Florida panthers. Nature at its um, best. Everglades, the same thing. They were protected because they went deep into the Everglades where humans couldn't bear to deal with all the bugs. And so when, yeah. the, and, you know, and when the Endangered Species Act came out, then this 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 group of, ki- of wolves there were able to expand. <clears throat> but, so our coyotes expanded their range when all the wolves were killed because there's a relationship that wolves mm-hmm. and coyotes have. In my talks, I always say wolves... Um, are the are the the big brothers? The foxes are the little sisters, you know. And yeah. Coyote's the middle child, and uh, they're all territorial, just like we are. Humans are territorial. We don't think we are, but we are very territorial. Oh yes, we are. <laughs> very very. That's why wars and, happen. Uh, um, that's right. And so, so well, yeah. No, but it, well, okay. I guess that makes because back when they almost exterminated, when it was that. Well, like I said, 1915 to the 1950s was the war on the coyote, and they didn't. They thought they were both the same, and they said that uh, they realized that while they were doing this, they were barely putting a dent in the coyote population, and pretty much almost wiped out the whole like the whole wolf population almost to extinction. And that's where they stopped Absolutely. and said, "Wait a minute, something's wrong. Why is their population like drastically dropping, but the coyotes aren't?" How come the mm-hmm. coy- like the, they killed millions of coyotes and the, the numbers barely moved? They're, they're, like you said, I guess the females old. realized they were thinning out. And- Not only that is wolves, um, wolves, um, wolves and coyotes are different. They really are in who they are on the planet. And coyotes have this unbelievable capacity to survive against all odds. Yeah. Against all odds, even over and above that reproductive thing. They still have this capacity. They are an amazing, amazing, amazing species. And so what happened is all these empty spaces, so what wolves once were before, coyotes would never go into a wolf territory. Yeah. Because people can actually see that in Yellowstone, because I did research in Yellowstone, that if a coyote goes into Yellowstone, because you see how they used to be, that relationship, and if it takes its chances, a wolves will kill the coyotes. And so coyotes have been always stayed kind of out of the um, wolf territories. So here all these wolves, two million wolves are killed. I always thought it was all open territory and they expanded their range. And of course, those here in Maine, they came right through Canada. Yeah. They came to a yeah. provincial park area. They're still they expanding. Were Yes, and so, they were female. So they're not, like wolves are more of a pack animal and they keep to a certain area because that's, 
that's their, that's their um, territory. territory yeah so how how is it that coyotes have just just expanded throughout the the nation like the country all of north america and they're still going they're showing up right. in toronto new york city right they, it's so what is it like they have a pack but then a few of them are like ah forget this and they just want they want to take off and start their own no they're basically they're both the same in that regard though because um wolves have families and they will disperse too they're just like you know um anthropologists say that the way we as humans our social structure mm -hmm. how we are okay so you know you were born to your parents okay and then you disperse you disperse oh. okay and so we and they do the same thing. So wolves do the same thing. Coyotes do the same thing. Coy uh, wolves have a family in which they disperse out and have a territory. Coyotes have a family in which they disperse out and have a territory. Very similar to that way. The coyotes, um, they are known as the species, the only species in North America that we know of, where they mate for life until death. Even wolves don't do that. So they are extremely faithful to their mate. And they have families, so they might, like this year in April and May, carnivores have their populations and coyotes do. If anyone that survives, usually only a third of them survive, life is really hard in the wild, and that's irrespective of humans. Um, one will maybe last and live a year, and they'll stay with their parents and help with the pups that are born next year. So they may have, just like in a human family, I have older sisters, okay? Mm -hmm. I may have younger brothers. So it's the same thing there. So the parents have older, older juveniles with the family. And when they're ready to go and say, I'm out of here, mom and dad, and then they disperse. OK, and so what's happening is what's happening in this country. And I say it's a continent because the Canada, too. And Dan Flores makes comment about that. They're actually still in their colonizing state because they are so persecuted across the continents. We they're they're we really having effect on the stability of their lives. So they're they're trying to settle down. Mm -hmm. They're trying mm -hmm. to settle in and stay there and then have their dispersers. That's very normal to have a disperse, but they have their territories. So coyotes that have their territories um, anywhere, even in urban areas, they have a territory. The humans can't see it, but they know it. OK, and, right? and they and their, their territories are in urban areas, in rural areas. OK, but because they have very little protection, it's almost like humans going. Our culture goes, we got those wolves. Boy, we got those bison. You know, we got all that. But this species, it won't give up. So we're going to just keep killing you instead of saying, wow, you're really cool. We want you here. And you have the capacity to live among us while the others do not. Wolves cannot live in our cities. They don't have the capacity to do it. Coyotes have so resilient and adaptable that they can adapt to live in a lot of different situations. Not necessarily their favorites, not necessarily their favorite places, but they can adapt to it. And because they're doing it, it's a good to it. Like there's a, a research done in Chicago Illinois, that the the city wanted um, biologists to do, and it's for 20 years, and they are finding that um, coyotes have territories all over Chicago, and they found they actually have radio collared coyotes, and they have this one video of a coyote at 2 a.m. in the morning. I don't know if you're familiar with the Loop in Chicago. The Loop is like the center of this huge, big city. Mm -hmm. It's 2 a.m. in the morning. There's no vehicles out. There's no humans. But here, prancing down the street, is a radio-collared coyote. And what they say underneath her is she's doing rodent patrol. So they come out in the urban areas and kill rodents everywhere because they know rodents are all over where humans are humans draw rodents dan flores actually makes that comment hmm. also in his book that coyotes have always lived on humans why humans always have rodents all around where they are and so coyotes play a huge actually a very very excellent role um in urban areas and they don't want to see people and they don't want people to see them so they come out at night and we've learned that they don't even they've learned not to howl in urban areas 
be quiet. We gotta well, be quiet here. That, that, that's so what I. That, that, that's what I wanted to mention here, is because I was saying how they can they'll they'll pretty much um, uh, reproduce uh, many times in the year, even though it's off season for mating season. And I think I heard this from Dan Flores, and he was saying that um, the, the the female will howl. And, and that's her notifying all the males, okay, let's go, we got to start reproducing, okay? And I had a fire pit last summer where I was sitting. I heard it constantly through the summer, and they, they do have a, there's a den across from me in the forest there. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story about that after, but so is, is that true? Because they, 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 they were mating, I guess. Every time I heard them, I'm like, oh, they're mating. You know, I have a friend over, I'm like, you hear that? They're mating, <laughs> So, to your question, it's a really good question. So, coyotes have a very structured life, all right? Mm -hmm. So, in North America, of course, you know coyotes live nowhere else on the planet but North America. They've only lived here. They've chosen only to live here, okay? They've never gone across the Bering Strait. Come mid-January to mid-February, that's their mating season. That is the only time for about five days of the year. Got this? Five days of the year, the mother coyote can break pregnant. The rest of the time... She's sterile. She so, cannot. Really? Give her. So, and yeah, one time and her mate and she only mates with her mate. So they mate for life. So she's not calling a bunch of guys. She and he. Are you ready for this one? Let's hear it. He is, he is sterile all year long, except for the time when she is fertile. Now talk about birth control perfected. Mm -hmm. So they mate and once they mate, you see that anybody, if you ever go in the snow in the wintertime, they walk along on either side. They walk together and they never leave each other's presence ever until they give their babies. They are very, they are deeply connected to each other. They are very, unlike wolf, more than Wilson. Wolf, wolf. Then <clears throat> come April or May. So we're approaching this time now, bam, bam, yeah. between <clears throat> April and May. That's when they have their pups. And all that howling you're hearing in the summertime, too, is a lot of communication that parents are having with each other. So the mother could be with the pups, okay, and maybe two of her older siblings could be there. And the father is out there hunting, and he's howling to her, I'm coming back in about a half hour, you know. <laughs> so they're communicating with each other because they do a lot of hunting for their pups during that time. Okay. They because they eat a real lot. So it's a very focused family. She's, and it's not like, you know, it's very, very different with cougars, the whole relationship that cougars have with the male and the females. This is, is like a mated life, and they are very, very mated. So she's not calling for any other, and no one else in that. So she may have a female, maybe a two year old, that was one of her pups. And another dispersing male may come along and join their family, which they do sometimes. They will never allow, the family would not allow them ever for her to get pregnant, her daughter. Mm -hmm. And they will physically block them. The reason being is that's part of their birth control is there's only enough food for the family to have one set of pups. That's it. No one else in the family is allowed. It's very strict birth control. So, so it, yeah. So why is so this? Sorry. No. So in stable situations, that's what you have. So in stable situations, they have three to six pups, and sometimes they don't have pups at all, or she may miscarry all her pups, or they may die. So why is there and so many coyotes they, out there? They have like this crazy population. Because it is ongoing year-round persecution of them. In the state, in the in the United States, there is free for all killing of them. Yeah, free for all killing. That we have a federal agency that in um, in April and May will get up in helicopters, spend taxpayer monies, and literally go up in the sky and gun down every coyote they see, and just because they're a coyote, and that is what I'm talking is that they're still in their colonizing state because they are so severely persecuted just because they're so successful. We don't yeah. like, so in other words, we're also a culture that doesn't like successful species. You're successful. <laughs> well, we really like successful humans, but we don't like successful species. You're too successful for us. Therefore, we're going to keep gunning you down. 
Yeah, they it says here in this article, 2018 Yellowstone Park, 68,000 coyotes were killed in the U.S., right. including 56 right. in Wyoming. So you see, when you see something like that, that is why, because those coyotes are keep trying to do that reproductive. Now, here in Maine, we have certain areas, like I say, some farmers have large acres. No one touches their coyotes. And so that female's having three to six pups like the normal. But even in that situation, if she's lucky if two of her pups live to be a year old, it is tough out there in the wild. Many die of starvation, eat, eat, eaten by other predators, yeah, but have I, disease. See, I, I, still, I still find it. It's, it's amazing that we've been hunting them so drastically over the years, but there's, we're still nowhere, they're nowhere near being anywhere close to extinction, right? It's, it's, it's insane. I, I understand there's reasons why you should kill a coyote. Like you said, farmers, livestock, you got to protect the livestock and they'll come after it. Can I say something about yeah. that too? Yes. So if you go on my website, coyotelivesinmaine.org, uh-huh. okay, actually embedded in that website also is another website that I created for all our people in the East and in Can- Eastern Canada is Farming with Carnivores Network. And so we totally have the capacity to um, to farm totally well um, and use animal husbandry practices. And we have farmers here in Maine actually who tell other people, no, 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 this is my coyote family who lives on my farm. Don't touch them because they have a stable, really? one stable mm-hmm. family. And that stable family, the parents teach them how to hunt their own wild prey. They don't look at farm animals as prey. And so it's a very beautiful balance that these farmers live with them. And, and plus they use animal husbandry practices too. And so the thing is, is that, but what if you're not, if people, and I find this in many, cause I communicate, even though my work is focused here in Maine around is that when there's a lot of killing of coyotes, what, and there's been research done, I called, you know, post-traumatic stress. Does that sound familiar? A lot of soldiers experience that people mm-hmm. in that we're seeing experience that intelligent, socially complex species are experiencing post-traumatic stress. So what happens is you stop and think of this as a human. If some individuals come into your family home and shoot your mother right in front of you and then shoot your father and you're terrified and you're running away, it's basically what happens with coyotes is that they have this really tight family and this violence is happening, and so it's a, it's a, it's a very, and they run out of their territory. They're terrified. What we're doing as humans is we're changing their behavior, and we're seeing that with elephants in Africa. So the way we behave to them is affecting their behavior towards us, mm-hmm. and it's a behavior mm-hmm. unlike the relationship they had with our native peoples. And so, what happens is we always tend to blame the carnivore. They're all the bad ones. They're all this. But we never want to look at ourselves and say, okay, in every relationship, there's a relationship. So how are we treating them? So is there any reason to actually hunt a coyote? Whatsoever. None whatsoever. In fact, actually, when we do, we're affecting really negative things on them and the ecosystem and ourselves. And we know that hunting predators, carnivores, like high carnivores, like coyotes, wolves, grizzly bears, cougars, okay, at least in this country. They have controls of their own population that they have been using tens of thousands of years. We go in there and try to mess that up. That's when all the trouble starts, and for us too. And so, but again, it's what we live in a world, it's very interesting, stop and think about this, Bam Bam. We live in a world, look at our human population, okay? Our human population is off the charts, okay? Mm-hmm. No one's no one has any heart to stop that either, okay? And so we've seen human population just going on and on and on and on and on, okay? But we're not. Then we go, then we look at our dogs, our domestic dogs. Our domestic dogs have lost that wild part of once they were wolves way, way back. Mm. So now that we feed them, and take them to the vet and get their food. They go to Bam Bam. They go to their 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 food bowl. Okay, they don't have to worry about hunting for food or starving. So what happens is, <coughs> the female can get pregnant anytime. Yeah. 
male can impregnate a female anytime. And so we think because of that is our human experience that that's how it is in the wild, but it's not. You yeah. see, it's very, very different when you're wild and you've evolved over 10,000s of years for survival and for food. So their whole concept of reproduction. So the way nature is created is that carnivores control their own populations and it's very complex, <laughs> totally wondrous, <laughs> but they control the herbivore populations. You see that circle of life? It's really cool. It is really cool. And it's funny, it's funny that you bring up the whole dog part. I, I love this one where Yorkshire Terriers, it, it, they're cute little dogs. People love them, but a lot of people don't understand where they came from. And I always say this to the owners, and the dog's freaking out. They're barking. They're all shaky, like battery charged. And I'm like, you know why your dog's all jacked up like that? It's like, why? Because that dog used to be a rat murderer. She's like, what are you talking That's about? Right. I'm like, that dog was bred back in kingdom days to kill rats. If they found a rat infestation, they would take one Yorkie, throw it into the rat hole, and he would decimate that whole rat colony colony in there. <laughs> And they're Absolutely. looking at their dog like, what? I'm like, yeah, your dog's a murderer. <laughs> Absolutely. Historically, historically. Yeah. So what they did is they took advantage of the predatory, the predator, the wolfie in them. Okay. Yeah. The wolf, yeah. the predator wolf. And they kept breeding them in such a way that they became tough little ones. And man, watch out. Absolutely. And like, it is. And, and that's the predator part that they really bred into them that was really powerful i'm gonna get that rat no matter what you know i just picture that cute little yorkie going into a hole and you just hear a bunch of screaming all the rats and then the yorkie comes out full of blood with a little tail sticking out of its mouth waving its wagging its own tail like let's play let's play It is. That's right. And oh, so we, we, we have kind of this mixed thing because we're living with, we are very, very domesticated. Mm-hmm. There's a part of us that is actually deep down beautifully wild, beautifully wild, way back from our ancestral times. But we're so domesticated. Yeah. See, so our animals, so domesticated, we're losing touch with what it means to be wild. So, and. We we are and we're pretty much we're jacked in we're we're computers now, everyone has a computer in their hand and we're we're gonna change real quick real soon, but about the dogs is that's another thing about why people, you know, are a little bit butt hurt about coyotes is uh, there's a lot of stories of coyotes killing people's dogs. Even Dan Flores said this: the way they'll get your dog, and as soon as you see a coyote that's near your dog, for one, you got to pick it up. Don't let it play with the coyote because that's what the one coyote does, right? He plays, he'll play with your dog. He'll convince your dog that he's playing with him. Meanwhile, there's probably like, let's say four or five more coyotes that you didn't know were there. And as soon as he leads it away from you, they're all going to come out. Well, they've had a lot of different experiences here in Maine. I've had experiences with a woman. She had a Siberian Husky and she's walking her dog. It was off leash mm-hmm. back in the back country area. And she comes and she's coming up a slope. And her dog was ahead of her, not a lot, but just enough when the slope, you know, she couldn't see it. Mm-hmm. She gets to the top of the slope, and this is for real. Her Siberian dog is sitting on her hunches in a circle with three coyotes, and they're having a chat. Do you think that maybe they're just sitting there because aren't, aren't coyotes like uh, predators of opportunity? If they, like you said, if they think it's going to be an issue, the deer's too big, they won't go after it, right? Maybe the husky was too big. Um, part of it, that, that kind of example is that, um, and I always tell people coyotes respond to, remember, coyotes are dogs, and yeah. our dogs are dogs. Yeah. Canine. And oftentimes, yeah. some dogs, when you think of Siberian huskies, are very as close to the wild as you can get. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, you're cool. And coyotes re- re- understand that, too. So the idea that coyotes want to get every dog they can, that is, um, that to me is an untruth. It truly, it truly is. What it is, is, is very, very much so, is I look at the sizes we've made some of our dogs. Little five pounders. Mm-hmm. So when Coyote mm-hmm. looks at a little five pounder Pomeranian. You're no dog. You're my prey. Okay. And also, we're finding, and some experiences in North Carolina with a person I'm helping down there, a pretty amazing person. Again, we're getting to that point, going back again to what I said before. 
is when we do a lot of persecution of, a, of coyotes and put them into post-traumatic, we're actually changing their behavior. And I think in some situations, some kind of tech behaviors are being changed towards our dogs because they are experiencing post-traumatic stress and we're shifting our behaviors towards them. And most people say, oh, sure, yeah. Oh, yeah, very, very capable because we're seeing the same thing with elephants in Africa who have never done anything like this before, before we start slaughtering them for their ivory. So we're seeing some of that happen where behaviors that are totally not coyote and have never been for five million years because of what we are doing to them, they're changing behaviors. And part of it's human responsibility, too. Of, of, of carrying that. Well, this one place in North Carolina, they talked about people are complaining. The coyotes have freedom, and now I don't have freedom anymore. My dog has to be on a leash in that. And so that's right. So once carnivores return, once carnivores return, as they are during our transitional time, or um, are actually recovering, we have to shift our human behavior. And before that time, you know, before you and I were born, um, and many generations, I'm a different, totally different generation than you are, mm-hmm. but before my mm-hmm. generation too, carnivores were wiped out here, totally wiped out, except in very remote wild areas. And so people who lived in urban areas and things, they never had to be, the biggest one they had a concern about was our little red foxes. <laughs> and and so here comes a, a true carnivores and also avian carnivores. Let me tell you, they can do a job as well. They um, People are not used to it. And so they don't know how to be with them. And before this was free for all with the dogs, you know, letting your dogs run all over everything, getting disease. So we're shifting, you know. Mm. And, and so, again, again, I think it has a lot to do with complaining about the coyotes are doing this. You go, okay, the coyotes are doing this. Coyotes are doing, well, coyotes are wild. What are we doing that's causing coyotes to do this? And so I how think do we, more share that? we as humans have to look at how are we acting that's causing this? How are we acting? Because we do that in relationships, a husband, wife. If one is really, really upset, the one is saying, well, why are you so upset? What, what behavior am I doing? If they really cared about each other, they figure that out. Human, and I say this in, dis- in respect for my species, humans have a lot of arrogance. Mm-hmm. We're never wrong. We are never wrong. It's the wildlife who are. It's all their fault. Oh, no, we're wrong until we realize it's too late and we're already wrong. <laughs> That's right. And so I think, there, you know, so these are some really basic human thoughts about ourselves as a species that we need to look at, that we, um, that we criticize and complain and therefore persecute and therefore kill. But the thing is, the more we do that as a society the more we'll just keep going like this. So well, you said we have to change our human behavior. That's How? In what sense? How? Well, what, in a nutshell, what's the answer? Well, first of all, I think is um, something of what you're doing today, and I, I, I respect you, Bam Bam, oh, for you. having this podcast with me today. I truly do, because you said, let's have a chat about this, so that we... I love talking about should- nature. Yeah. <laughs> it's, great. So, it's all around us. Why wouldn't we why wouldn't we know more about it? Is. Just here. That's right. Mm. And so that we get to get to learn more about the world that the, the life that we share this magnificent planet with. And we get to understand the high animals that live with us and the ones that aren't so quote high that we learn about them. And what happens is our lives are richer. And I, I really believe in that fear goes away. Fear is a emotion we do not engender, and it's a big time now, you know. So I think that's a huge piece of of sharing with each other, is really really big, um, and also finding way. And we are learning, like in farming, there are so many. If people went on the Farming with Carnivores Network website, uh, as all kinds of animal husbandry practices that people use, and farmers are totally successful. They sleep at night. This one farm in Maine, they have goats. Okay, and goats in the summertime don't uh, don't like to graze so much in the in the summer during the day because it's hot. So they like grazing at night when it's cool. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so they have a pasture that's quite a distance from the home, but they have electric fencing around and they have a guardian dog. These are special dogs we brought from Europe that have been bred for thousands of years to protect from predators. Probably thousands of dollars. <laughs> it's, an Italian, it's an Anatolian Shepherd, Great Pyrenees. They're 140 pound mm. dogs. And their dogs wow. are, they are meant to protect. They never kill the carnivore. They stay in the fence, but they talk. And so what happens is during the night, they're in there grazing away. The guardian dog is in there. The coyotes come into their pastures and they're doing road and patrol. And they and the family will hear their, their guardian dog barking at the coyotes and the coyotes barking back at them. And they know all is well. They come in the morning and they see coyotes scat on one of the trails. Mm-hmm. That is where we want to go, you see? And their goats are happy and safe and all's well. So the, uh, the guardian dog talks to the wild dog. You know you're not safe if you come here and, and the wild dog says, cool, I know that already. Okay. Because they live in a stable family. That's a farming example. So, so you're saying by, by killing the coyotes, we're striking a fear into them and that's causing an issue. And so what we should do instead of, because I, I think the, the, major, is, is the major reason they're, they're killing is what, safety? And they're worried about overpopulation. So you're saying if we just stop killing them, things might be a little bit safer. There's other ways around it. So instead of a hunter shooting the coyote, just get some, you know, European dog or the dogs you mentioned there, because that would probably help a lot. And uh, kind of they will just end up doing their own thing and be a little bit more peaceful out there. Absolutely. And coyote, coyotes, places where coyotes like here in Maine who live very stable lives, like I said, they're not they're not overpop They're not having lots of pups. They're yeah. not because they have a limited territory with limited food. So they're living like coyotes used to live amongst our native peoples. Very stable, very, very stable. Life. There's a lot of coyotes who live like that, but there's a lot of coyotes who don't. Well, I saw that. Yeah. Well, I, cause I, I saw it. It's, it's funny because it's just, um, uh, news radio in Toronto. It's called news talk 1010. And, uh, they posted a video of someone at a park and there was two coyotes going through the park and the person recording it. I heard him talking. Turns out it was my buddy. <laughs> so I called him up. I'm like, was that you? And he started, he's like, yeah, that was me. I'm like, well, what happened? I'm like, you, you two coyotes. He's like, yeah, it's crazy. I was walking my dog in the park by the, um, the lake, Ontario Lake. Two coyotes walked by and they just stared at him. They were just curious, but they, they didn't come near the dog. No growling, no aggression. They were just stared at him as they were walking past. But I understand why coyotes would end up in Toronto. Like you said, they they like rodents, right? You ever see this? You ever see the size of a Toronto sewer rat? My oh. God, the the thing is like a this is bigger than a raccoon. And they can find them as humans can't. Instead, no, humans will use poison. Humans will use poisons and do everything imaginable. Try them, and they never get them. Coyotes can. So having having coyotes in, in, in urban areas is a huge advances to actually to urban areas. It well, really, really does. Yeah. And that what your friend experienced is kind of like kind of experience. I would say that native people had. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm on our way. So the coy- those two coyotes were probably were very, very stable. You know, they're mm. very stable. <laughs> um, they um, and and that's how you want them. Probably they were mates. They were mates. Okay, they're made for life. Mm-hmm. And so they're just on their way to go find the rodents. Yeah. Nice to see you. I got to go get lunch. I'm going to do the rodent patrol. And that's the kind of situation. But we live in a world that that has not been passed down mm-hmm. to us. So it's real yeah. slow. And what happens is fear it always looms there. Yeah. Okay, we got to do this. We got to kill them. Well, you know? And yeah. so that's the norm. That's the norm how humans behave. That's the response. We have to back off from that. Yeah. So just because we can kill, should we be doing that? Because we're making it worse for ourselves. And mm. isn't that cool that you can have that? And that those coyotes had a sense of their wildness. They had a sense of their wildness. And they've had many experiences with people who experienced coyotes on trails. And you can't get to a certain point, a, a, di- a distance from them, they back off. See, they have a safety <laughs> place there. I was actually, I was testing that. I saw them. In the summer, I drove by and saw a pretty big coyote on a rail, railroad. He was just by himself. So I pulled over to take a picture. And I was curious. I, I'm, not, I'm not scared of him. I know that. That's why I posted what I posted on my Instagram. Because a lot of people have the misunderstanding that they're, they're very dangerous. You see them, they're going to attack you. I'm like, no, they're not going to attack you. Because you're bigger than them. <laughs> right? They're That's, afraid of humans. Too. Yeah. He, he, yeah. And, and I, I, so I saw it. And I was like, I wonder how close I can get. I got pretty close. 
think about 15, 10, 15 feet. He just stared at me, just stared at me. And I was like, okay, this is as close as I'm going to go. I don't want to push my luck. So I started kind of backing up. And it, it, isn't that, that's another thing too, right? Don't turn your back on a coyote. Just back up. Don't turn your back on a coyote. No, because then, then, he, then that shows weakness and then he might get a little idea. No, no I think it's just a, a nice um, um, coexisting skill. I so always you thought you just don't turn your back because as soon as you turn your back, you show fear. And now they're like, okay, wait a minute. Now I have the upper hand. But if you back up and you make keep eye contact, then they kind of there's a mutual understanding. You your eyes on each other, and, and you're aware of what's going on. It's mm-hmm. just a, a good experience to do that. Absolutely, and you, you know that's typical. That what you experience with a coyote of a coyote that's kind of a stable is that and you'll find that with a lot of urban coyotes because they're not being persecuted. You see what I mean? They're safer in okay. cities. Um, so and they're, so, they're not out for humans and stuff. They're just kind of want to be there on their territory. They just do don't what they see do. coyote. They don't see. Coyotes don't not see coyotes. Well, first of all, that coyote's behavior to you was like real coyote. That's what they do. Okay. But you know what, what, what she was doing? She was reading you. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. You look like a cool human. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're okay. They read you and they like to read us. They're very, very intelligent. Oh, it was very fixated on me. It, it did not break eye contact. And it didn't move. It didn't. It just stood in the same position. It didn't yeah. turn on me. It didn't. Nothing. It stood still for the whole time. And I was guess it's kind of like other animals, like a squirrel. He'll stare at you, take off. Raccoon, you know, he'll stare at you, skunk. They, they, they'll, they give you just minimal time. The, the coyote, fixated, eye contact. And I was like, wow. It's that sense of self that they have. There is this intelligent sense of their own mm-hmm. presence. And they see you, and we've seen this with other species that are highly intelligent, like orcas, the the killer whales, the elephants. They they have a sense of reading you. They they truly are community. They see you as another fellow intelligent being on the planet, and they're reading you. It's cool. And so we lift the fear do away with persecution we could have so many amazing experiences and they will always remain wild you know we always want them to have that sense and we do that by not feeding them at all we want them to do their work in the ecosystem and so we're we actually by the culture that we live in is we're cheating ourselves of an amazing relationships with the wild because we are persecuting them. We are missing stuff. So We're let, missing stuff. Let, let me ask you this because you do agree that hunting tickets, okay, so we need to keep control of some deer, bears, and other animals to keep a balance in the ecosystem. This is the reason for hunting tickets. Would, would you say that there's a point that coyotes can get to where it's like, Kate, hey, listen, we got to put some tickets out. We got to kind of, we got to thin them up just a little bit. No? no because what we do is... The thing is, coyotes will do it themselves. So in other words, once they cease to be persecuted, they're not going to do that compensatory. um, So so they'll just do it on their own. They're not going to do it. They're not going to do it because they're going to be stable. Actually, my talk, I show our Baxter State Park here in Maine is magnificent. I don't even call it a state park. It's a wilderness area where coyotes live. And they're totally stable there and dynamic. They have the stable dynamics that are there and they live very, very balanced, stable lives. And so people come into the park and they never see them. Okay. They may hear them all at night and that's all. So it's very, um, it's, it, it's, it's basically what you and I and our cultures are experiencing right now, Bam Bam, is that we don't know what it what is, can be like because all we've known is the persecution of this species. And we've never known what it's like. We've never known what it was like to, by our native peoples. Mm-hmm. And so part of when I get my talks, I kind of share what our native peoples experience and um, actual oral histories that they've passed down. And they blow you away at some of the experiences they had with coyotes, literally blow you away of the experiences they had. You gotta check it out. Were very wild to them too. Yeah. But a, a, a relationship of respect that they had, and coyotes, a, a benevolence to them. We're very much like the dolphins in the oceans. Coyotes were very benevolent to our native peoples. So if we and leave well, still, we'll check ourselves. Yeah, yeah. very, uh, very, very, uh, very fascinating things. And we're missing all this because of what we're doing to them. 
And I think we're, we're what are we passing down to those who come after us? So I, it's a really important thing that we, you know, our lives are enriched by creating religious relationships and learning about them. And we're in this trans mm-hmm. time of transition. And, you know, you here chatting with me, you are part of that lively, wonderful transitional time. Well, you're starting, to, a- you're starting to make me think a little more openly about it because when I, before we had this conversation, I was under the assumption like, sure, okay, we got to We're going to killing coyotes should happen at some point, just like other animals to keep a balance. But you know, learning this, you're saying that if we just stop, they would just check themselves. So this is very interesting. And I'm glad I heard it all. And uh, I, I have a question because I did something the other day with my buddy Smalls. And I was telling you that uh, my place, I could hear them howling. So I kind of had a general idea of what direction they were in. And I look at the map and there's like I've been in that forest, there's trails and everything, but there's a more dense part of it that's off the trail. And I started getting the idea. I think I'm pretty sure they're in there. I went for them. Me and my buddy went. I printed out this whole paper. Uh, I don't have it here. It's in my pocket, in my jacket. But it says how to track a coyote den. You know, they like to be near water. Okay, there's rivers and ponds in there. Uh, they'll bury themselves in kind of like a hole. So you got to find that. They want to stay like somewhat on the lower end of a hillside. So I basically went through the map trying to figure, okay, these are the general areas where they tipped off that they like to be. I spent three hours trying to find that den. I think I found one piece of coyote poop because when I Googled it in the step-by-step guide, it showed you like things to look for, prints. Um, the snow was melted, so that was a little hard. Found a lot of deer prints and deer poo, so I know that they're, they're there. Uh, I'm pretty sure I found a piece of coyote turd because, like they said, there's going to be a lot of fur in it. Right. Mm-hmm. I found only one dropping. and But even that one dropping there, they have such a broad area. So I'm like, oh, so I spent three hours going around the whole thing. And by the river at the bottom of a hill, I found a hole in the ground. I was so nervous and I took a peek in there. I'm like, oh, I wonder if they're in there. Was that a bad idea? <laughs> what if that? Well, first of all, first of all, they wouldn't be in there yet. They wouldn't be in there yet. Coyotes only spend time in their den once the pups are born and only yeah. for about six weeks. Mid-March that, they start, gone. no? Mid, they said, yeah, they said mid-March they would start. Oh, uh, most of what I know is that they usually, I mean, they may mid-March start um, digging their dens. Yo. Digging their dens and find, because they don't do more than, they do more than one. And if you've been around there, they're going to come and smell that bam bam's men's here. I'm moving it now. So if yeah. anyone disturbs it, they're gone. They will move their pups during the night. And so they usually have about two or three. The mother will dig about two or three dens or find three or three dens. Oh. Because if it's disturbed in any way, she'll move them right away. I just thought it'd be a fun adventure to do. Everyone's like, why would you do that? Are you out of your mind? I'm like, nah, it's me and Smalls, whatever. There's two of us and... Like, if we find them, we'll just kind of keep our distance, have sticks. You know, if they do kind of walk, we'll wave them and walk backwards. But is it, it could have, could, what my question is, could that have been dangerous for us if we actually found the den and there was, there was pups? Well, if, the, if there were pups and that's basically, it, danger isn't coyotes. Coyotes are very afraid of humans. That's the answer I wanted to hear, and that's what I want my friend, all my friends that I talked to and told them I was going to do that, they needed to hear that. So they're afraid of humans, okay? And they um, want their own private life. And so what we always encourage people to do that come April or May, if you know there's an area where the coyotes would have their pups, give them space, okay? Mm-hmm. The reason being is, you know... Wildlife has so little space left on the planet left for them. We humans are everywhere. So it's almost like this thing of respect, of giving them that's their private place. And they 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 love their pups. I mean, they truly are so committed to their pups that any any anyone who comes there is a danger to their pups. And they will tend to they will tend to move in. So what happens is when people let their dogs off the leash, we've actually have films of that showing like a Rottweiler coming towards where the den was, but the Rottweiler didn't know it. Um, and the two mates are like this. They're standing there like this. They're not attacking the dog. They're like blocking them and blocking them. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't have to be the case. 
Shouldn't that be the case that they, during this really special time of their life, that that they have to feel like they have to protect so much, especially from dogs, but also from humans, because they're very afraid of humans. They're very afraid of humans. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a, there's something I was going to... There, that, that, that's what I wanted to hear. They're very afraid of humans. Because that's why I don't fear them. A lot of people fear them, but I mean, you don't have to fear them. <laughs> Just kind of, like you said, keep your space. But I was, <clears throat> was going to say earlier... There's something I did notice. You you kind of piqued my uh, my thought on it was how you were saying we're cha- we're us humans are changing animal behaviors, mm-hmm. and then I was thinking about dogs and the, I when when I was younger in the '90s, you could have a dog outside in the back of your truck. Common dogs were left in the garage because dogs were guard dogs. Not many mm-hmm. people had small dogs, and if they did, find they were inside. But most big dogs. And I remember growing up, you couldn't just walk up to someone's dog and play with it. That, that was a big no-no because there was a chance that dog is going to attack you. And it's not the dog's fault. It's just because that's how all dogs were raised back then to be mm-hmm. guard dogs. Mm-hmm. And I started thinking about today. And in my neighborhood, when I'm walking, I could pet any dog. There's not one dog. Big, the big dogs, too. There's not one dog. When you see its face, it's like, I always ask. I'm like, can, do you mind if I pet your dog? And they're like, yeah, sure. You put your hand out, and then the dog jumps. Play, but you can see dogs; they they've shifted drastically in the last twenty <laughs> years, right? They are yes. they they are like truly man's best friend. They're they're just children now because they're being mm-hmm. babied to hell. <laughs> but which is yes. it's not a bad thing; it's a good thing. If more people, if if people didn't do this to the pit bulls, we wouldn't have abandoned Ontario. That's right. Right. That's I, right. Like the the one dog that I want is a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. It's not a it's a cousin of a pit bull. Beautiful little dog. I want it because it's a nice size. I, if you read its characteristics, it's exactly a match for me. And it has nice muscle. You know, it's just nice body structure. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I want to get one, but it's part of the band. They're, I think they're working on lifting that band because they literally put out this pit bull band with no real structure. No studies on any of the other dogs. And if you go look at a Staffordshire Bull Terrier playing with kids on YouTube, just what the hell? You're denying me this dog because you did a you made a bad judgment call. You didn't no studies, nothing. It's it was the owners. That's why they messed them up. Right. It's the behavior. It's, it's the human behavior towards them because they saw the power of this dog's body, yeah. and therefore <clears throat> people who were violent people used them and bred the, and made them. Their lives are quite miserable by these individuals who do this and made them this way. So again, it's a human causing this behavior in the dog, and therefore, and that, and, and I've had friends who have pit bulls and and, and a pit bull part that they're here. Great, great dogs. And they're they're a sweetheart. I mean, I really kisses all over and everything. Yeah. So that's, but you know, the same thing with the dogs. The same thing with wildlife. So it's the same thing. It has to do with human behavior. Our human behavior greatly, except that because beings are wild, we that that connection that we have, we don't even see it happening, because people are so disconnected from nature anymore um, that they don't realize that how much our behavior really really affects them. So no, that is, and that's a a really good piece that you brought up about dogs because it's the same thing. Coyotes a dog, mm-hmm. they're a dog, they're a wild dog, and what wild means, I am free. I have to count on myself for everything and no one's giving me anything and I don't want anybody to. I am free. Freedom is what who makes who Coyote is. They are like the epitome of what it means to be free. That means so much to them. And wildness is to honor that and know how um, as humans to to live with it, you know. So should we be wrapping this a little bit up so we can keep your people forever well, and ever? I'm going to go to the bathroom for like two seconds. There's, there's two more things I want to ask you, and then I'll we can finish. Okay. One second. Okay. Oh. I'll show my book then. Are people watching? I'll show my book. So this, this, is, my, this is my book. Well, he's in the bathroom. I am Coyote, and I wrote it for the people. And it's from a single coyote's journey through life from the time that she is in utero in her mother, a wild mother, to the time of her death. So I wanted to take it from a a coyote's point of view. You know, it's challenging for us as humans. Put yourself in a wild being's place. 
See if you can do that. Instead of the way from our point of view, put it from their point of view. And that's what I did with this book. So she was born in Algonquin Provincial Park here in Ontario. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking about my book to everybody. I don't know if people are listening. Are they here physically present or are you going to show this later on? I, I can, I can post that myself. for sure. I can keep it in there. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So this, basically this, um, this, my book, I am coyote. Um, it, it has a lot of what you and I have been talking about. And I wrote it for our people from a coyote's point of view. From her point of view, she was born in Algonquin Provincial Park. It's not that far from her me. <laughs> yes, in Afra. And she, her father was a wolf and her mother was a Western coyote. And she shows her dispersal and how she meets her mate and really goes through their lives from her point of view. I really like this. A really renowned marine biologist says, I love this. says, Jerry Bistein takes us so deep into coyote's skin and behind the eyes and nose, huh. which reveals intricacies and perceptions of creatures. So who she's, live life us. she's a kai wolf, the hybrid. Yeah. Right. So she, they're, they're coyotes. And oftentimes that term is used, but actually really a lot of scientists do not approve. I go along with that because coyotes are coyotes. Mm -hmm. They're through and through. And, you know, historically, 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 before humans were even on this planet, on the on North American continent, these species were, the canine species is a unique species in that they're interacting with each other. So coyotes were breeding with red wolves, the uh, Eastern Canadian wolves, and they were back and forth. So there's a lot of that. They're very capable of doing that. But we won't get into that. That's another yeah. whole thing. So I won't oh. keep you any longer because so that we can. Do you have anything else that you want to share? I'm always happy to. As, um, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. I, I did. I, I don't know if you have time. I want to ask you about your center a little bit. Sure. Um, what, is your, what does your center do? Do you, do you take in injured coyotes, adopted coyotes, or pups that were abandoned? How does it work? What's the, what's the purpose? Okay, so my coyote center actually is not a particular place. And I went through all this with individuals saying, and, and wise colleagues that say, um, no, you need to go wherever people are, Jerry. And so it isn't a place, but if you go onto the website, I speak of our coyote centers every time that we come together. Coyote center is every time we come together to share, to speak, to ask questions, to respect, to act. That's what the Coyote Center is. Oh, so it's, so it's not you a sanctuary. And I, right. You and I are a Coyote Center right now. Oh. And those oh. that you share this with are Coyote Center. That's cool, isn't That's it? That's great. However, I do work one of um I do work with a um amazing amazing rehabilitator who rehabilitates wild beings and she focuses carnivores. And she's very um, supportive, uh, um, deeply supportive to our coyotes here in Maine and everywhere. So she uh, she's like part of it. So she is a rehabilitator who helps them get back to the wild. Um, and so I work with um, our coyote centers really, uh, we do very many creative things. So we do lots of things with kids. We do work with artists, musicians, I love, you know, words are just not enough touching human spirit or for us to evolve as a species. And so using the arts is a powerful way to do it. So we work with photographers, artists, musicians, theater. We do marionette shows. Um, I'm out there on farms with farmers, one of my favorite places to go. Um, I love meeting the guardian dogs, these great dogs that do this. I love being with people who feed us, our farmers who feed us, and, and I help work with teachers. So, and we just, right now in Maine, we're, we have a law that's going into our legislature. So once in a while, we go to the law. And we're doing that now. We've been doing it for a year of engaging our legislators in the state <clears throat> to create a bill that will give our coyotes here in Maine more protection so they can settle down. 
That's and stop wonderful. Having to be in that colonizing state. So it's been a delight. We have all kinds of cool mayors doing mm. all kinds mm. of things and relating, and our legislators getting back and chatting with us. It's so cool. It's democracy in the action. It's really democracy working the way it should. So it's really, really cool. So, and, and I love working with people. So, you know, the, the, the wild ones are perfect. I work with people. That's interesting. <laughs> and, so I work with many. and I love with children. Children co- come uh, and young people. Someday you have to inspire me or share with me down the road. We always wanting to bring young people into this more. Um, I really believe that we do not engage our young people enough. Our, our, our teenagers, high schools, and young college people enough to make of them adults who can inspire as well. Um, I love doing that, and that's really an effort that I'm striving to do for, because I love um, being with and mentoring and having them feel their own power. That's great. To make a difference <laughs> or to create on many different levels, you know, so... Uh, that is what we're about in this ongoing. We're always right now this for in our legislature of Maine is our really big focus right now. And it's been over a year of an adventure. And that's what it is. <laughs> it's very interesting. And it's amazing. I, was, I love that conversation. And any any but, links or any kind of um, information that you want to send me, I'll post it in the descriptions and it will make sure okay. people can find out everything. But I have, I have one last thing I want to tell you. Probably It's probably going to make you very happy uh, if you don't already know it, which you might, because you're so involved with coyotes. So, you know, Canada Goose. And, yes. you know, I, I always see postings on social media where they're saying they're slaughtering all these coyotes. It's somewhat true, but not really. When I looked into it before, I found out that Canada Goose was getting their furs from auction and trade. So Mm -hmm. some of it was from farmers. Most of it was from hunters or farmers are just, it was, it was from trade. So they got constantly got their fur from different sources. So Mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to look into it before I talked to you to see where they were at with that today. And this is the new headline as of 2022, April 20, April 22nd, 2020, this was written. And this will be done as of uh, 2022. It says Canada Goose will stop buying fur, but sort of. Uh, Canada Goose has long stood by its uh, use of fur, even as fashion of the biggest names vowed to stop selling it. It's hard to imagine the company's signature $1,000 parkas without their coyote fur, trimmed hoods, cocooning city dwellers in Arctic great warm weather. Anyways, but it says here, but on Wednesday, Canada Goose announced that starting in 2022, the company will no longer buy new fur from trappers. By then, Canada Goose will reclaim fur, the company said. Uh, fur that already exists in its supply chain and the marketplace. As a part of this effort, Canada Goose, which is based in Toronto, which I'm close to, uh, plans to begin buying back the fur ruffs from its customers' coats with the intention of recycling the fur in the coming months. So uh, I'd say that's a big win for the coyote community. Yes, it's just, it, you see how is that slow process of saying, mm-hmm. you know, this is, we don't need to, be using their bodies and also then it's not supporting those who are killing them you see what i mean and then farmers don't need to kill them if they use animal husbandry well, practices well, and so you know it's just it's get we get away from the killing as the answer well like see? they said in that article it's arctic grade so if just say out in the north the natives are have to kill a, um, a fox because they they need to make their own coats that yeah. fur will protect That's them different. from their harsh climate. We don't need that in Toronto. No. It's not that cold. Like I That's have a, right. I have a Eddie Bauer coat. I don't know how you, how you say it. The F faux faux fur, whatever. It's fake. Feels mm-hmm. real. It's fine. Yeah. You know? That's right. And also just have availability of other kinds of of thing. People who live like the Inuits and everything that live in the north. They are separate from the rest of that culture that's making all those kinds of things, and they're they're using what they have done for centuries, um, mm-hmm. which is the animals' bodies to to make their fur coats with. And it's a very different thing. It's a very very different thing. I yeah. agree. We're past that. that too. The little bit steps and pieces you see about how humanity is moving, and that happens because a consciousness kind of grows. 
And so consciousness grows, and it's almost like I always speak of it take the golden pebble. Yeah. Out there in the pond. Okay. And what happens is that's what we have, how we evolve as humans, you know, we keep evolving and it gets large, the consciousness gets larger and larger and larger. And when that consciousness is large enough, then we as humans step up a little further in our evolution. We step up a little further in our evolution because that's what this is all about. Oh, Jesus. Our- Sorry. Hang on one sec. Whoops. No. Sorry. <laughs> that has never happened on my podcast. <laughs> well, that's, that must have been... that's okay. Maybe that's our sign that we yeah, should go yeah. now. I will let you say. go. You have a lot of things to do. You, you are... Um, well, and you as well. You as well, Bam. And sometimes, too, it's good when you have a talk for about an hour, hour and a half. It's a good limit for, for people. It's a good amount of time. You I'll, know. I'll split it in two you, parts. You know, it is. Here. It's a good, it's a perfect amount of time. Thanks for spending I'll send time. you a couple of things. I'll send you a couple of things, our website. Okay? Sure. I'll send you a picture of my book, too, because I love for our, me, it's our Canadians, especially up in there. Yeah. She's from there. And so there's a connection. There's a connection. So, Bam Bam, thank you. It's a pleasure speaking with you. you and too. all your questions, all your questions were right on. I, I loved all your questions. Very thoughtful. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that. Very, I appreciate that. Show. Thank you. Try. Enjoy the rest of your day now. You too. Take care. Take care, Bam Bam. Bye bye. Bye.